September the 28th, 1990. A racing driver lies motionless on a track in Spain. Martin Donnelly has been thrown from his car after a 160 mile an hour crash. The loader slammed into the guardrail. The whole front end of the car had disintegrated, throwing the driver onto the track. The car so badly damaged that it was impossible to find out what had gone wrong. Racing can be dangerous. Mistakes, or in Martin's case, mechanical failures, can have severe consequences. But until that day, Martin hadn't given that much thought. I think my attitude was, those accidents happened to other drivers, not me. I never had any sort of major serious accident, you know. Very seldom would I spin a car, you know. I was, was able to fail the car's limit. And it helps me live with the fact of the accident that I knew it wasn't my fault. To the great relief of the whole paddock, Martin was alive and he was then helicoptered to hospital in nearby Seville, suffering two broken legs, a collarbone, bruised lungs and concussion. Martin was determined to recover from those injuries and return to racing, and he tried everything. I believed in my head I was going to get back into F1. I went to the guy that got Nicolera back in their car within six weeks of his very accident at the Nürburgring. I thought if he can fix Nicky in six weeks, he can fix me in two months. Me not realising just how bad my left leg was. Welcome to F1 Beyond the Grid with me, Tom Clarkson. You might have seen that shocking image of Martin lying on the racetrack after his life-altering crash, which happened during qualifying for the 1990 Spanish Grand Prix. It's featured in the movie Senna, because Ayrton himself rushed to the scene to help. He and Martin were friends, boys from Belfast and Brazil, who met in England while racing in the junior categories. Back then in the 1980s, Martin was part of a group of young, quick drivers that included Damon Hill, Johnny Herbert and Mark Blundell. They were buddies, but they were also rivals, all desperate to make it to Formula One. Martin made it thanks to his speed in junior categories and support from team owner Eddie Jordan. EJ is known as a brilliant dealmaker, but it sounds like Martin was every bit as shrewd. The deals he did and didn't do shaped his career. His time in Formula One, first with Arrows in 1989 and then with Lotus, was short. While he recovered from his injuries, he saw his friends win races and championships. As you'll hear, things could have been very different. But Martin's is an incredible story, and he's never stopped racing. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Martin, it is fantastic to have you on the show. It really is. Now, your Formula One career was tragically cut short in your first season. The Spanish Grand Prix scene of that career-ending accident was round 14 of 16. Let's talk about the season up until that point. How pleased were you with how things were going? You know, it is a, a privilege to be in Formula One. It's a custodial, it's, it's not many people, especially these days, are able to get there by just performance. Obviously, we well know the fact that it's um, a money man's game or a wealthy father that helps buy into a team or gets their, their sons. But at the same time, you know, you've got to be able to drive a car. And teams just don't give drivers out to Willie Nelly because your dad's got a, a couple hundred million or a couple of million in the back in the back pocket. But back then, you know, I got to F one on merit. And I got the F one basically through three people, namely my father, Morton Senior, who was a devoted uh, enthusiast of Formula Ford from back in the day. And we bought a, he bought me an old Cross A thirty two F that man still used to race himself back in the day. Next after that was another Irish man called um, Frank Nolan, who picked up the mantle from my father and took me to the UK. And, and Frank's name you had on your visor no, all the way so. to Formula One. All the way, very much so. Because if it wasn't for Frank, I would never have been in England to race in Formula Three because he was the sponsor, you know. And, and Frank was a hard man, you know. He says if you can't win a BBC Grandstand series or or an F three, he said, what's the point me back you do any further? So that was that was all, and there's a lot of guys behind me that were always a backstabbing and, and telling Frank why he's wasting his money and all the rest of blah blah blah. And the other guy that um, 
that got me to have fun was, was Eddie Jordan, you know, or the, the Love of the Road. And he helped, he, he got me there. He got Johnny Herbert there. He got Jean Leslie there. He got Eddie Irvine there. Obviously, you know, he made good money. But the thing is that if you sign a contract with EJ and didn't expect him to make money, then you're you're in a fool's fallacy because without EJ and doing these contracts, um, that was the lift that, that, that I needed. And, and everybody else. And was EJ the one that did the deal with Lotus for 1990? No, it was me that did the deal. And the, the ironic thing was... <laughs> Martin, if he was sat here, would he agree oh, with he'd you? Oh, he'd be pulling his, he'd be pulling his, his, his wig off. Um, we went to Lotus. We met with Peter War and Freddie Bushel. And we had Fred, his uh, business advisor. I went there in a big boardroom and we sat down there and we went through the terms of the contract and Peter War was quite an intimidating man, ex-military, spoke a bit awfully, awfully and at the end we went through the, the contract, small contract, it wasn't a big contract and I just said, Peter, if you don't mind if myself and AJ and Fred step out and, and talk to yourselves and we stepped up, we had to, we had to leave the room, not them. We left the room, went into the, the, the corridor where the, the, the entrance hall was, and EJ had the contract rolled up in A4, and he stopped me with, it's a great money, it's a great money, this is F1, he says, don't you miss this on me, and him. And he said, what's the problem? And I said, EJ, well, basically, there's not enough money. He said, what the hell are you on? I said, it's not Formula 3, it's not F3, there's F1, blah, blah, blah. Because he was on 15%, he wasn't at the time. So uh, I went back in, and I was doing the talk, EJ, it's hard to believe this, just went like sippy, said nothing. And Fred as well. And there's two things. I said, I wanted more money and I wanted more money per points on the rest of it. I remember rightfully, Peter said, well, he said very sternly, well, how much, we, this is like a three-year contract with options. He said, well, how much are we expecting to get, Martin? He says, I said, at least uh, 1.2 million. I said, okay, fine. And I said, very hell. If I had gone like 1.5, of course, then during the course of the year, you realised that Warwick, Del Boy, was getting 1 million for one year, you know? So anyway, that was that. Glad to get in there and, and put up and shut up and, and get on and, and, and justify, justify your, your seat, you know? You out-qualified your teammate Derek Warwick six times in 13 races. And the other ones were about the hundredths of a second. There's for very seldom we were more than two or three tenths apart, but it was down to hundredths at some some of the races. Now, your first season of Formula One, Derek had been in the sport for a long time. Um my read on that is it was a good job by the rookie. I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't deny it. It's only re- it's only recent times when you start looking through extracts in magazines, you see that Del Boy was an F one with Tolman. In 1982, maybe even one, not too sure. Obviously, the cars weren't overly competitive. But, I mean, with that time in F1, my envisage in life is there are natural drivers. Natural would be A, Schumacher, B, Senna, Alonso. Guys that can get into a car that's not necessarily on the money, but their driving style and their capabilities, they can drive around those problems, right? Then, no disrespect, if they're listening to this, this podcast, you're like, so your Mansells, your Coltards, your Hills, who got in the F1, but weren't really front pace abilities. But with time in the F1, and with confidence and mileage, you get better at your job. And when you're there, you learn more, and you get more confidence, you, you get more experience, and that in itself brings time regards lap times but there's the ones that are born with a natural gift like Max Verstappen who can go out and get into a car and go two or three laps this car's got a problem that car's got a problem do this do this with advice and they get on it you know and Damon being my old teammate I risked it Damon many a time but with his time in 3000 and his time in F1 with Williams um, got the and learned learn from Senna, learn from experience with being a tester with, with Prost. You learn these things, you know, and you sort of grab hold of it and, and get on with it. What was the biggest thing you learned during those opening 13 races of 1990? <sighs> Fitness was a very important thing. 
Yeah, I always thought you were quite tall and skinny, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Well, when I was in three, look at pictures in 3000 compared to when I got into F1. Got a massive uh, crash diet, got involved in getting uh, the, the weight off. But we went testing at the start of the year, I think it was March time. We went to Estrel. We only had, I think we only had one car then. And Del Boy, obviously, being number one driver, went out and did a few laps and then I got into the car. And I think within 10, 15 laps, the neck had gone. Because turn one is quite fast, but the last turn, like yeah. the horseshoe, you know, the it's just the G4 cranks up, cranks up, cranks up. And then we put on new qualifying tyres at the end of the day. Yeah, got no chance. So that gave me a bit of a fright. So you get back into the gym, you get the helmet over the weights. And then we got to Phoenix, Arizona, which is go stop, go stop. There's no long radius bends with, with G-Force. Uh, but when we got then to Interlagos, everybody, including Senna, had the helmet strap on the left shoulder because it was an anti-clockwise circuit. So the left neck muscle, which doesn't do a lot uh, in Europe, not one, was a, was a neck breaker. And everybody had the e- strap Even on. Martin Donnelly. The even new Martin face. Donnelly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he probably double straps on. <laughs> what about that year's Lotus, the 102? I remember before the start of the season, Rupert Mannering claiming that the, that the team was going to score 40 points. How quickly did you realise that was an over-ambitious target? You see, bear in mind that Rupert was the new team manager, wasn't he, back then, I think. The year before, we had a, a Lotus Judd. And one, I think they had a bit of development with some Tickford 5-5 heads. But I mean, obviously with the, with the little Judd, it, um, with the Leighton House it was quick because they were an economy with, with um, the designer fella he's a new a new designer yeah. new, one of his first cars and it was mega quick look at Paul Raycourt almost, almost won the race but massively on the part I mean the Lamborghini V12 sounded great fantastic and any circuits that were tight and twisty like Jerez like Monaco we could be competitive but any circuits with long streets like Hockenheim or Silverstone you know you just playing catch up. We were doing, I think, from memory, we had six hundred forty brake max compared to the Hondas and the Ferraris. You were just you were playing at it, you know. And um, we had our, our main gauge was against uh, the Lota car with Eric Bernard and um, I think Suzuki, and we always compared ourselves to those guys, you know. But against Del Boy, you know, I was able to hold my own. Some circuits that I, I didn't note, I hadn't raced on, but I remember that. He said his two best circuits they loved were Silverstone and Monaco, and I I qualified him in both. And he wasn't uh, sorry, <laughs> Dell. He wasn't very happy, but you know he's fiercely competitive, and definitely the British bulldog attitude, and a hard a hard competitor. Well, and let's not forget that wind the clock back just what two or three years, and Senna Ayrton Senna had vetoed having right. even though Delboy had signed, hadn't he? Yeah. I think it was it was a complicated one, wasn't it? But yeah. he was vetoed by Senna, so he was clearly respected and quick. Did you share data? We hadn't got data back in those days. We didn't have this, this thing called telemetry. It was, it was a it was a it was a rev counter gauge and your your fuel pressure and water pressure. And that was it. Describe a debrief with Del Boy then. It was always it was serious. There was very little uh, messing about because you know debriefs were. Bear in mind, we had an hour and a half warm up on a Saturday morning. A Sunday morning, and then you had to give them the debrief and lead going into qualifying. So we had an hour qualifying on the Saturday and on a Sunday, and then the race was a two-hour race. So you had different setups in the cars because the car with full tanks and qualifying tyres uh, was a different beast compared to the car you raced on, you know. And bear in mind, we didn't realise when we signed the contract that Lotus was already financially strapped for cash because they didn't build a new tub. So the tub that we got into was a tub they built for Nakajima and for Pique, who are like five foot seven, five foot six, you know, like jockeys. And we are five foot ten. So we never really got into the car comfortably. And if you look in the early pictures and testing, we had these little small mirrors in the car and there's a what I call a dome it was put on the front of the tub. So myself and Del Boy needed to come out of the out of the cockpit because our foot was on the throttle pedal and our knees was on the bulkhead. So you couldn't actually take your leg or your foot off the throttle pedal. So after a while, with the amount of bumps like interlagus, your leg would go numb. 
So that's what caused me to spin and do like because after I don't know what I mean, I was with twenty laps, thirty laps, I couldn't feel my legs anymore. So we, we had to come out, but then we failed the, the height of the ten miller rule from the air box to from the tub. So what they did was they built a cone out of glass fibre bonnet from the tub, which then allowed us to come out of the car a bit more. So you see our shoulders were inside the car. I've got pictures of me going around Lowe's Harp and in the in the, the, the Lotus one oh two. I'm more out of the car than in the car, you know. Have you ever got to the end of a busy day and realised you forgot to pick up that one key ingredient for dinner? Or perhaps it's your turn to prepare something for the local bake sale and you've only remembered at the last minute. Well, don't worry because DoorDash has got your back. With DoorDash, you can get dinner, snacks, household essentials and everything on your grocery list delivered in under an hour. And with more than 300,000 partners, DoorDash gives you the opportunity to support your regular neighbourhood go-tos and local businesses or get a quick fix from one of your favourite national restaurants like Popeye's and Cheesecake Factory. So you're not just getting the things you love, but you're supporting the community you love. And you don't even need to leave your house to do it. From the stores and restaurants to the dashers driving around, each order you place provides a new opportunity for everyone involved because with DoorDash, there's a neighbourhood of good in every order. For a limited time, our listeners can get 50% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter the code GRID. That's 50% off, up to $12 in value, and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter the code GRID. Don't forget, that's code GRID for 50% off your first order with DoorDash. Subject to change. Terms apply. Let's talk about your accident now. Mm. It's been more than 30 years. 28th of September, 1990. You said that the car should have performed well at Jerez, so you were quite confident mm. coming into the weekend. Yeah, yeah. I think... Um my normal mechanic guy called Chris Dennis, who's still a very good friend to this day, lives locally to me, uh, said that if I had completed the last, the last lap, which was the last herpin on that day, which I think was a Friday, wasn't it? I would have qualified P5. You know, it was not a bad effort, considering. But, you know, tight, twisty, very little um, long straights. We had a chance to shorthand. Monaco, I think I qualified P11 or 12 overall. We go somewhere like Silver's on set where the engine are out to stretch themselves. We just, you know, we needed more horsepower. We just, we just didn't have it. And the rest is history. Well, what do you remember? Well, the weekend before Perth. was the Portuguese Grand Prix. And we, we didn't, it wasn't worth flying back out on the Sunday night to come back out again on the Thursday. And I had some friends, Ed and Jenny Devlin, which we'll go back to later on, were having a place built in near Harvia in Spain. So they come out to the villa. So we did. We flew Lisbon, Madrid, Alicante. I went there and I got I got sunburnt. We were on the sun pedalos in Harvia. And then we got a, a Citroen shooting break. They call the baggage when we got to Gibraltar. And then we went to the circuit. And this is Thursday now. The Thursday before Thursday, the Spanish yeah, yeah. Grand Prix. And after that, I don't remember much. Apparently, we got the two scooters from the team where I took my fiance Diane round. And then Jenny came on another scooter and said, Look, this corner is quite fast, third gear, it's fourth gear. But there's a part, as you come round to the last two fast corners, you can sit at the back of the paddock. And they watched there with, with Roberto Moreno, who hadn't pre-qualified his car at the time. And Roberto, like me, was fed by Ed at Ed's calf, as then because Roberto drove for Ruff in 1980, I think it was. And Ed said to Jenny, here he comes now, the qualifying lap. And I was just past them, went off into the barrier. And uh, A was trying to get over, the, there was a fence there, a gap in the, in the circuit. And young uh, Roberto was trying to actually pull Ed off the fence to get him off because he wasn't allowed to go on the track at the time. And he said, be fine, be fine, leave him alone, leave him alone. And then later on that day, we were going back to the paddock to my fiance that he's okay, he just broke two legs. And they told Roberto the same story. And Roberto said, no, day. I said, that's not possible. He said, that guy, that guy was dead, you know. A lot of people didn't know at the time. And our good friend, you know, Mark Gallagher, went to the Seville Hospital to stay as the report to see, to report back to be like Morris Hamlin back in the paddock and the other journalists as to my condition. And along came my Ayrton. Ayrton came outside the, the intensive care. And he said to to Mark, he said, if the Donnelly's anything, he's in a plane to get back, financial help, just let me know. What actually happened? What caused the accident? Well, I was told by the team... I'm not mentioning any names, that 
back in the day, we had um, a slightly raised step in the the tub of the car, and there's a belt crank that was bonded underneath the tub. So our dampers lay parallel at the bottom of the tub with a with a glass fibre shroud to protect over it, just clipped on. And I can't remember the front suspension was push rod or pull rod, but the neck of the damper was another small belt crank which was activated, which then went to the main one that gave the support. So the main one's bigger, bonded in, long arm, down to the one down there, to the push rod or pull rod to that. The bell crank was working loose in the carbon fibre, which had created a lot of friction, which then meant that the reason that the front damper neck on the left side of the front broke off due to the amount of friction. And unfortunately for me, it broke off just as I turned into the fastest corner on the circuit in qualifying at the back of the pits. If I had lasted another millisecond later, was the last quarter, last carbon, big gravel trap, big tyre barrier. Okay, it probably would have been sore, but certainly when the car would have broken half. Had you had any failures like that earlier in the season? Yes. Second Grand Prix, Interlagos. Again, we only had two cars because the team at the time hadn't got time to build a third car, I for for Del Boys, his T car. And we were doing a I think it was a Friday morning. I came in the pitch, we were down the far in the pit lane because we did finish well in the constructors. I came in, we put a bit more front wing on, on the on the arrow, a bit more on the front, went back out, first flying lap, coming to the centre S's, the two front wing end players just dropped onto the onto the, the tarmac. You go around you, you back of the guy, you realise it's just not normal, backed off, watch your mirrors for traffic and uh, got back to pit lane because you drive up into the pit lane, down to the parked the car, pulling them backwards in the garage, and the front of the front garage door came down. You realise this, this is pretty serious, not just a two minute job. And the extra downforce, because the wings are attached to a nose cone, which is made of back then glass fibre, which then was bolted to the front of the tub. And that extra downforce pulled the front of the tub off the car. Well I think the principle was the year before we had a nice light V8 chassis, right? Now we have a V12 engine, so we've got to take some weight out of the car somewhere and they took it out of the build of the tub. So less carbon, make it whatever it was. So some people say it was built of crisp paper packed paper, right? So even when it was all working, were you getting a lot of flex in the chassis? Not that I know of, not that I knew of, no, no. But the FAA granted them to use resins, glues and a bit of metal material to bond that back on the front of the tub. And that's how I raced that the next day. So you understand when I had the accident, Del Boy would be concerned. And for them to leave that decision to for Derek to go out and race that car was wrong. They said they'd done their best they could to check his car to see if anything was wrong with it. They couldn't say anything. It has been doubly checked and it was fine. And they never knew at the time what caused that accident. Then over for their investigation, it came to light. So when you see pictures of you lying on the tarmac there in Hereth, legs all at strange angles. What do you think now? I relate to it being me, because of the orange helmet, the orange helmet from my colours. But if you don't remember something, I, mean, I can go out now in an F1 car. I drove the car at Goodwood some years ago, first time back. And I was going for, we organised to go faster time up the hill that weekend. I got some special tyres, Maeve on some um, hill climb tyres. And it wasn't an issue because there's no memory there. And I go out racing now, and okay, you're wary of accidents, but you still go out there to, to prove a point and try and go, and go out and win races. But I have to because I've also had another accident then, and I've been told by my surgeon that if I fall and break this leg again, he says there, there won't be a third time. Because he said the problem he had fixing the leg the second time, he said there's more bone on a track in Europe somewhere, he said, than there is actually in your leg. He said, and now I've got a metal plate in there holding the bone, bone together. He said, if you fall, break it, he says, that's the end of it. And of course, accident number two was yeah. a, a moped Yeah, 20 crash, miles an <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crikey. I mean, what was the extent of the injuries then? The first one? The first one. Oh, it was pretty serious. I mean, not a lot of people realise. Bones will eventually heal, and Sid Watkins knew that. Um, and he knew the size, the impact of the accident. That was pretty, pretty serious. And your internal organs don't stand still. 
they go with the inertia. Uh, and I think my accent at the time was like 42G, okay? And he knew from experience that my organs were going to shock and not work. So it was important to get me out of Seville, back to Heathrow, back to England, to his hospital, which was the Royal London Hospital in Whitechapel. And I was back there, I think, on the Tuesday night. And as, as he predicted on the Wednesday, my kidneys, my lungs, everything just shut down. So I was, into, I was on a respirator for seven weeks. I had kidney dialysis every day for three hours. And he advised my mum, he said, you know, it's my touch and go. And she got the hospital chaplain to come and give me my last rites. And twice on the operating tables, uh, my heart stopped twice. So I had to stand clear, get the old jump leads on there and give me a jump and bring me back again. So three times, Sid brought me back. Those two occasions were at Royal Sid London. Watkins Royal London yeah. Hospital. And for those listening, Sid, of course, was uh, the Formula One doctor at the time. And so the first time, were you dead on the asphalt? I stopped breathing. I wasn't breathing because I'd swallowed my tongue. But between the accident and the getting to me, and such what was going on was 11 and a half minutes. So the brain and everything else was start of auction for that amount of time. Peter said it has a, affected me. <laughs> I think the wife would agree. You know, and he, he opened my visor. He could see I was asphyxiated. I, I got a pale shade of blue. And he got two tubes and stuck them up my large, large nose. Got me stabilised again by breathing again with the oxygen. And he cut the helmet straps and passed the helmet up. I think somebody said, sent him there and, and he took that for a bit. And get me back into the medical centre, get me stabilised, and then flew me out down to Seville. And then he sent him and then talked to Sid for not two and a half hours in his medical centre. And then Sid got in a car and drove to Seville. What about bones? How many bones? I mean, oh. your left leg, let's... Well, the left leg's now an inch and a half shorter than the, than the right. Because actually, and it really is. You're yeah. just, for people listening, you're actually showing me your legs. It really is an inch and a half. Yeah, I had it well. And I should be wearing a build-up, but I mean, the brain, after about 2,000 steps, doesn't tell the leg to pick up, and you trip. And if you're in an airport, you're somewhere, you trip and you go forward. It's embarrassing. So obviously, the leg, left leg was in a bad way. That was shattered. Shattered. That's why, because all the breakages, the bone, you can't get them back together again. So you fix it in there to let it all heal. The femur was badly broken. The shin was badly broken as well. The foot was all mangled and twisted. So now the left foot is fused because I can feel from the knee down. But on the foot underneath is hypersensitive. But the top of the foot is just, and my toes are all curled like a claw because there's nerve damage. What about the right leg? What about your arms? Right legs. I think the right leg was okay. Shoulder blade is still broken here. Prevalent my eardrum because the helmet uh, cracked at the time. And the, we had massive big speakers brass speakers in the helmet, they got banned after that. We all know use the internal earplugs. Hands were fine. I think hands the hands were fine. And you'd, I've got the steering wheel is all twisted and broken. There's no big there. But a lot of it was just internal organs and too many, too many to remember. How much had you thought seriously about the dangers of motorsport? Had you ever seriously thought that something like this could happen? You'd seen Johnny Herbert have his accident yeah. at Brands Hatch in 1988, for example. I was there, yeah. I think racing drivers have a unique way of, of dealing with that. I think my attitude was those accidents happened to other drivers, not me. I never had any sort of major serious accident, you know. And I, when I raced and when I, when I tested, I asked any of my engineers, very seldom would I spin a car. You know, I was, was able to feel the car's limit. And it helps me live with the fact of the accident that I knew it wasn't my fault. But if anybody says, you know, Martin, I test 3,000 cars after that, I test uh, three cars, I can drive them, just I couldn't get it in five seconds because the leg hasn't got the mobility anymore. What about your recuperation then? How many operations? I couldn't put a figure on it, but there was a lot. Even after I left hospital, I went back to back of Holly Street and had operations on, on this leg. Because I believed in my head... I was going to get back in the F1. I was going to say, what kept you going? It was that belief to get back in the well, top car. I was in the hospital and then I went to Dungles in Austria. And Willie Dungle was the guy that got Nicoletta back in the car within six weeks of his very accident at the Nürburgring, the Norse life. And he was the guru. A lot of the, a lot of the physiotherapists and nutritionists 
that serve as the F1 teams were subcontracted by Willie himself. Okay, I thought if I've if you can fix Nicky in six weeks, he can fix me in two months, right? Me not realizing just how bad my left leg was because I had external fixators on the leg and I burst an artery in November time. And because my leg wasn't being moved, I was in a bed from September through to February in the same position. I wasn't moved or put on my side because there's fixators on my leg. So when my artery burst, they rushed me off down to the, the, the operating theatre and did a, they did a fan graft of my right leg on my left leg to, to stem the blood, which worked. But then, because they wasn't being moved, they glued my uh, thigh muscle to my femur. And that's why I limp and can't bend the leg. How close to being amputated was the left leg? In Seville, very, very close. Uh, when Sid left the circuit, he took a young lad with him who could speak Spanish and English. Now, the guys operating in the operating theatre, when Sid got there, as far as they were concerned, I was their patient because I was in their hospital. And Sid said, no, he's my patient. I'm the FA delegate. He's under my duty of care, right? And this young lad, bless him, had to translate between Spanish and English. And they were, it was a proper on full fighting match shouting and I, th- I think the guy did a, did a podcast or whatever called called The Angel of Donnelly part one part two it's on the internet or on the it's somewhere I've got recordings of it somewhere how he got traumatised trying to translate what Sid was saying to the surgeons and they just said no we have to take this leg off because the amount of blood I was losing so Sid actually took his own trouser belt off put it around my leg and pulled it tight to stop the blood flow and see the leg. But if it hadn't been an hour, half an hour later, that leg would have been gone. <laughs> it's an unbelievable story. But yeah. So at what point did you realise, no, I'm not going to be racing in Formula One again? First time I had the quad plastic done, Bran Roper was a surgeon. And he used to look after the Chelsea football team. And while I was in my room, my private room, he came up to me and said, uh, in the room, he said, look, I'm telling you now, Martin, he says, your days of being an F1 driver, he said, is going to happen anymore. I said, we cannot get your leg to bend, bish, bash, bosh. And that's the only time I broke down and cried. Because after all the operations and all the pushing to do this, I'd come back from, from Dungles because Dungle couldn't do any more for me. Got me rebuilt, got me strong enough to walk about and anything else, but to go any further, he needed this be, to be released. And he said that to me. That was it. And then I thought, the years go past, you're carrying your physiotherapy and your hydrotherapy for a full year in the um, Norfolk and Norwich Hospital. And then a guy I raced against called Matt Bartlett was a surgeon also. And he said, look, Martin, said, I think we can do something for you because we're now five years further down the line and we do things differently, right? So I said, okay, fine, give it your, give your best shot. And the first time this guy banned me, we got up to 60 degrees. And um, Matt got up to 120 degrees. So that was enough to like... I that's know, the bend. That's, that was a proper bend back. Yeah. But again, the skin on the kneecap tore again. And again, you're back into, back into the leg being straight and all gets stuck back down again. So after the first club plasty, to me, that said, you know, the guy upstairs trying to tell you, said, Martin, you, they brought you back to life three times. You know, you've got a family now, you've got a life, you're involved in motorsport. Let it go. And Ayrton's death in the 1st of May, 1994, I think eventually for me, was the final needle in the coffin because, you know, he had his means. He had a great life. He's three times world champion. You know, who am I compared to him? And uh, let it go and concentrate on my own business then, which was Martin Donnelly Racing. And he did that for 15 years, then joined Comtech and the rest of history. How easy was it to let it go? Not not easy at all. Got and that's what I did. I gave up my education. I was at university for two weeks, got a reprieve, came to England, rode the wave, seemed to be good enough, got these opportunities, got paid to drive an F3 with selling it along with Damon. And then I got paid by EJ to drive the, the camel cars and things were good. Life was, was and free both clothes and company cars and it was good. You can't deny the power of a good night's sleep. You can adopt healthy screen time habits and have the best nighttime routine possible for your schedule. But if your mattress is uncomfortable, then a deep, restorative sleep is going to be hard to find. 
And as someone who spends most of the year jumping from hotel to hotel, it's been a joy to try out an Emma mattress. I'll never return to a standard spring-loaded mattress again. Engineered by sleep experts, it's the perfect mix of both foam and springs, which gives your whole body exceptional support with absolutely no sag. So no more rolling into the middle of the bed for me. It's so comfortable, firm enough to ensure my back feels fully supported and soft enough to lull me into a deep sleep. But what's great about Emma products is that they come with removable washable covers and you get up to 200 nights trial so you can test out your mattress at home and with free delivery and returns and a 10 year warranty thrown in as well. Find your best sleep with Emma product and test the products up to 200 nights risk free. Save 5% on top of all offers at Emma dash sleep.co.uk forward slash grid that's emma dash sleep.co.uk forward slash grid martin you mentioned senna several times mm-hmm. when you were talking about the accident tell us a little bit about your relationship with him because i think it's fair to say he was closer to you than most drivers. I think so. I think so. Well, see, myself and I Ayrton came through the Ralph Furman School of Education, you know. And I think a lot of Brazilians came that route, started with Philip Paldi, then you had Chico Serra, then you had Roberto Moreno, then you had Ayrton Senna, because they all were quite a niche in Brazil. And Ayrton came across, and when Ayrton came back in, when he joined Ralph in 81, he was married. And she hated England, because she had to cook her own food, wash your own clothes, our own clothes, whereas in Brazil, they have the, the house servants, don't they? And it was cold, and it was wet, and it had frost, and they didn't get that in Brazil. And when I heard went back at the end of, I think it was September, didn't come back for the Formula for Festival, he was gone, and as far as he was concerned, that was it, because she didn't want to come back. Anyway, uh, Tommy Byrne got his drive in 81 and won the festival, got him into the TV F3 meeting at uh, Thruxton, and the rest is history for him. And I heard him said, I'm a racing driver, that's what I do. And he came back, left her there. Now, I got a car from Rolf in 1982. I got an RV81, but it was given to me by Rolf himself. Alan Wardrobe from Scotland Engines gave me free engines. So anytime Rolf had some updates or we needed to do some rebuilds to the car, I came across and lived with Angie and Rolf, as I heard him was most times. He has one house in Attleboro. And we used to go to a restaurant in Attleboro called The Doric. It's like an Italian type of restaurant. Quite nice, nice ambience. And we got to know the guy there personally. And we all went to the, the four of us for, for, for meals there, you know. That was the, the thing to do. And we got chatting then. Then our, Rolf, then Ayrton went to two later with Rolf, with Bush and Green Racing. And then I got a, an R, I got a, a 40,000 car then as well. So I would say over the course of from 81 to probably 83, we probably had about 25, 30 meals all in Run Doric and Run Albert in the Doric. And, uh, you know, he was very fond of flying his remote control cars or, or his planes. He'd be over there at Snedden doing that was his thing. And then, obviously, he's a very committed man. Didn't sort of fool slightly, but had a good sense of humour. You know, he used to tell good good jokes and he liked to wind people up and play pranks. That was hurting. And then F3 became more competitive for him because he had a good competitor in Martin Brundle. And EJ was flying, got the good engine updates in in... in in, in Italy, and that's when I heard and sort of, I think, realised, you know, because you're on the bit, obviously, then, because he cleaned up from the Ford, European British champion, from 40,000 European British champion, you know, came out in F3, and that gets the attention of the, of the F1 teams. But did the dinners with Martin Donnelly carry on? Then, no. No, because he went off into Europe, into stratosphere. I then got into F3 in 86. And I then had already done two years of F1 then. Martin, even in 82 and 83, could you see that he was the real oh. deal? You well, knew where he was going. Yeah, yeah. You'd you watch him you... test at Stirling. They're testing there three, four days a week. It wasn't like today we have to do sessions. It was, I remember testing on Rolf, four days a week, get there at eight o'clock in the morning. You start at nine, yet you go, run, 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 wide track, narrow track, uh, different dampers, different step, long base, short wheel base. And you get to four o'clock in the afternoon, you get the long quorum and fast you can. And you get to four o'clock and your head starts to talk, you're physically knackered. And you don't come on, put the effort into this. 
and you push the five o'clock, so they don't know if the car is getting quicker or slower because you're physically getting tired. So you need to sort of push for them. And back then I could do that. And you get to five o'clock, you think, oh, thank God for that. Your head drops, come back to the pit lane, get out of the car. Rolf's come down from being up the control tower. I think the guy was called Pete at the time. The cigarette in his hand, smoking in the pit lane. I said, I've just talked to Pete. He said, we can stay until seven o'clock tonight. <laughs> what? And there's four days a week, nine to seven o'clock. But what a perfect grounding that for was people like you and Senna and all these other great guys. Yeah, you know, you know, you wouldn't get that these days. And that yeah. was my grounding when I went in, in day three. I yeah. knew about springs, dampers, you know, how a car worked. And I could so then, was Senna pleased when you arrived on the Formula One scene? Yes, he came to see me. Yeah, he came to see me. Uh, and I'll tell you another situation now, because back then, they could, he could afford to go to the best restaurants and get a very wealthy family. But we all ate an Ed's Cafe. That was a place to go. That's where everybody met up. There's an old trucker's cafe. And the truckers used to pull in the, the car park. It was all mud. And, uh, you know, it was like a greasy greasy spoon, greasy breakfast, you know, fried, fried bread, fried slices. And the Ardens thing, he called them their most mornings for a bacon sandwich. That was his name, bacon sandwich and a cup of tea. And then we went to that 1990 to Imola, I think it was. And I brought it out as, as a as a friend. And we just walked down the pit lane, just meandering, looking in the garages, we walked down. And we got to the McLaren garage. And I heard it was at the back of the garage, holding centre stage with some journalists. And he obviously spotted, I think, most of the main thing, he spotted Ed. And he pushed the journalist to the side. And he ran out and grabbed Ed and gave Ed a big, big purr hug. And he said, what are you doing here? What are you doing? He said, have you brought my bacon sandwich? And that just, Ed just was, was a wreck. Tears, you know. Because I heard him was there in his F3 days, not again for race begins. But after that, everyone took him away. And we're going back then to 1990. And there was Ed. And he came out and gave him a big bear hug. And Ayrton never forgot, you know. And, and were you surprised then that Senna came to the scene of your accident? No. I think you'd spoiled his quick lap, actually. I did. I always say I'm doing my speech. I said, I'm well known for spoiling Ayrton's qualifying lap in Jerez. But even out after that, I went quicker again. He said, a new lap record. Even passing two guys were messing about. So, I mean, Ayrton was committed. He had... Um, an abundance of driving ability. He had a great feel for a car. He made a commitment and left Brazil. He left his wife and they got divorced. They didn't go back. Uh, and that all takes, you know, you come to to a country that, that is a very different way of life to living on a beach, glorious climate, Brazilian food, to come to England to eat in a greasy spoon or calf and stay with that commitment. And that's just a different mindset. That's a, You have to have an inner belief that you're going to make it. When the phone starts in, in 83, you know you're on the right path. It's how you manage that, not going for the right drive at the time. Because I, heard him, I don't think himself felt he was ready for F1. Yes, he drove for Frank, and he's doing great lap times around Downton Park, but he knew Downton Park quite well. So he took himself into Toman, let me learn my craft, spent a year, I'm not sure it was two years there, and then he went into Lotus, Yes, I'm now getting more confident. And then the big teams come and says, okay, fine, but this is what I want paid. I want you to pay me this. Bish by boys, I'm not going to give him what he wanted, you know. Very, very, very astute. Let's talk about the junior career. You talk about the Rat Pack, don't you? There was uh, so much English, British talent, wasn't there, um, around at the time. And when I think of the Rat Pack, who are we talking about? We're talking about Damon Hill. We're talking about... Derek Warwick, yourself, Martin Brundle, Perry McCarthy, Johnny e. Herbert, Jonathan Palmer. Steve Soper. Steve Julian Soper Bailey. Touring. Yes, Julian Bailey, of course. I think you guys even still hook up for lunch now, and the don't late you? Johnny Dumfries, you know, all good guys. Describe the atmosphere <laughs> among you at the time. We're talking mid-80s, aren't we? You're all, all, all ambitious. Fierce rivals, fierce yeah. rivals, you know. We used to go and play golf together. We used to, Johnny, Dave and myself, Marky, all go off for a day off or go and play golf. Well, we knew that once you put the helmet on, if you want to come past, you had to eat some grass. You know, there's there's no quarter given. <laughs> and we're all up to the same drives. And we all have we all have nicknames. And I'm Damon we call Secret Squirrel because you never tell you who he's talking to, what he's up to the full of full year, and he never 
always kept his cards close to his chest. Is another thing I'm trying to say. He's called Secret. And we talk on the phone. Hi, Secret. Hi, Del Boy. I'm called your man because I very seldom remember people's names. And even here working at Polestar, and I can't remember people's names. Perry Mad McCarthy. Mad Dog. Mad Dog. He's called Mad Dog because he's just does three things. Johnny is called the little one because he's quite small. Well, what about your rivalry with Damon Hill in particular? Mm. You were F3 teammates and... I mean, come on, who was quicker? I like to say I was quicker. But Damon was, Damon, Damon got the F1 because he wouldn't take no for an answer. Very determined, wouldn't lie down and play dead. Uh, and a very competitive driver, you know. Way back in the day, Stanley employed Jonathan Palmer to be our, get us fit type of thing. He used to drive to his house every six weeks down in Hampshire. He then takes us around to this RAF base to Colonel Farquhar. And this guy would then, for about four hours, she'd try and kill me, myself and Damon. And then this guy then would write, would write a report to JP saying, look, Damon's more determined. Martin did 40 push-ups, Damon did 42, you know, bish, bash, bosh. And uh, then JP got that um, copied and pasted on this the paper and sent off the cell net, you know. But I, I think that overall, I was quicker. You know, we had qualified him. We had a, we had a stage down in 80, 88, I think it was. I won my car and I knew the car inside out. They'd been married to it, knew what made it work. I said to get them waters, said for 88. I said, don't we go out and buy a new car? If I come back to F3, that's the car I want, right? And he did he did order two RT32s. And I stuck with the RT31 and we went in race, so we were competitive. And then Damon, I, I don't blame Damon for that. Then Damon complained to Sal that they had the choice of two cars. So I then had to use the RT32. So he's put the RT32 back on the back end on the RT31 and we just couldn't make it. I was then qualified 6th, 7th and losing points. And then Damon won the British F3 support race and Sal said, Martin, if you want to come back to your old T31, you have to get Damon's permission. So I made sure I got him just after he won the Grand Prix support race. I said, Damon, do you mind if I go back to my old T31? No, he's fine. Everything's on good worry. Went back to RT31 for Snederton, uh, stuck on pole, won the race. EJ was there that weekend. And uh, the rest of history, I got the, the Q8 drive. And the last five races in 88, two wins, two seconds, a pole and a DNF. And that launched me onto the international market. Yeah, that was a third in F3000, yeah. with, despite doing only a handful of races. Four, finished four races, yeah. Do you feel that as the cars got more powerful, it suited your yeah, driving definitely, style more? Definitely. Because F3 back then, you, know, you only have a certain amount of horsepower. And they weren't particularly quick. There wasn't a great acceleration out of them. And it was all about carrying momentum into corners and out of corners. And some days you'd get one corner flat because of wind direction. And after 86, 87, I did the marble test at Donington and was quickest by a long way more so than Stephen Modena on New Towers. But they gave that drive to Vogt de Wieler and to Jean Alessi. They went to Onyx with March and that car wasn't... Then Renner came out with a new car that year and they weren't particularly quick. So I had to go back into F3 again. But this time, with selling it, I was getting paid good money, as was as was Damon. We had company cars, free mobile phone builds, uh, wasn't paid. We were getting £1,000 for a win. Five hundred pound for a second and ten grand just to come out and to show up and race, which is great, unheard of. And then I got the deal with EJ. He said, "Marty, you come with me. I'll stick by you. Don't care what they say." Blah blah blah. I went and spoke to Peter Waller, uh, down in Kent, and he always said, "Well, we never hold you back, Martin." So he rang Glenn Waters from his house. Glenn wasn't particularly pleased. He said, "Look, I'm not happy, but as long as you place Martin with a like for like driver, be fine." And then, of course. Uh, Damon found out because Damon was also the, after the same drive and all got mad they were going some th- threatening legals over 600 grand and he said Marty Marty you stick with me don't you go back there blah 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 and for a bit EJ he did stick and eventually sent it just dropped the case but for that sound that in F3 you know I wouldn't have got where I was you said right at the start of our chat that there were three people yep. that got you into Formula 1 your dad Frank Nolan and Eddie Jordan you really stick by EJ. You think you couldn't have done it without him? Because it seems to me there was a lot of momentum with you at that point mm. in your career and you might have made it anyway. Or am I doing EJ a disservice? Well, it was EJ got me into the 3000 drive and I had to pay money for that. Then the EJ realised I hadn't got the money. 
because I said to you, Jerry, that my f- sponsor, Frank Nolan, died, I think, of 42 of a, of a coronary in a massive heart attack. But nobody knew that Frank hadn't made a will, right? So his wife, Rio, had, I think, four kids at the time. She couldn't go out and buy curtains or covers for the house because the banks freezed all his assets. But I told EJ that Rio was going to come along and pick up the tab and pay for it. So the first race of Brands Hatch, right? <laughs> You're like, as bad as each other. He's like, who could call and who the, the, the most? And that was a big, big gamble I took, you know, because I risked everything. And I won Brands Hatch. The next weekend after that was Birmingham, French P2. And then momentum was good. So then I think EJ realised the money wasn't going to come. And next thing I'm on a plane to Japan, a plane out to, so this, out to Europe. And so any money that... I owe DJ. He was getting from the the three thousand team in Japan, and he got goes money. Then after that, four months after me selling for DJ, he's paying me big money to back then fifty k to raise them three thousand. You know, and where Sean Leslie brought money to pay for the drive, but he had to leave Marlborough to get the Campbell team. Tell me more about your Grand Prix debut now, because yeah. uh, of course that wasn't nineteen ninety. That actually came the previous year, French Grand Prix eighty nine. What triggered the thought in my mind was you mentioning Jean and Lacey because you both made your debut at the same race. Now, you were in the Arrows. I was great and very scared and privileged for the opportunity. I wasn't physically ready for the drive. I knew that at the time, but you you got to go with it. You can't say no. And we both had to sign these sports EJ management contracts with EJ. It wasn't really it was a contract for age one racing, but under that was Sports EJ contract, which was, if you want to join my team, you've got to give me 15%. And for me... 15%. Over how many years did you have to give him 15%? Oh, don't quote me. I think three. For me, it was an easy take because it was 50% of nothing I was earning anyway. Um, and uh, Johnny says he never had to sign that contract. I don't know why. Um, but the time also, Jean was... So Jean was leading the championship in, the, in uh, European F3 then, 3000. So French Grand Prix, he's leading the European Championship. If EJ was doing the job right, it should have been Jean that should have got the drive from. EJ should have gone, Jean, Marty, look, it's French Grand Prix, he's leading the Championship, I have to give them the opportunity. Because later in that week was the major point of my, my career. Ken Turtle landed some camel support from Duncan Lee. And his driver was Palmer, John Palmer, and Michele Alvaretto. And Alvaretto was apparently sponsored by Marlborough. Not the team, just himself personally. So he had to take the Marlboro of his overalls and McKeeley wouldn't do that. So, of course, EJ's got rid of it. Ken, Ken, I can drive for you. It's Sean Lessie, he's Europe, the European champion. He's a lot quicker than Don Lee bloke, blah, 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 blah. Give him the drive. In steps Sean. Sean knows Paul Raycourt quite well. Because you can see that when the race started, the first time at the big accident, all the French drivers with F3 experience were on the right hand side of the track and they caught a cut the herpin, the, the tight first gear, the second gear herpin, and went straight across the inside. That's why I learned that from when I went back there in the least trophy. So I was just be on the inside, any tire smoke across the inside. I came out third, it was great. <laughs> um, you learn. So Sean got the drive, and of course, he was with Prelly tires back then. Prelly had a great qualifying tire, super soft. Lukey qualified second or third, and Martini qualified second in Phoenix. Prelly's were a great qualifying tire, and the rest is history. You know, and then John did turtle for a year, signed a contract for Williams, of course, being French Sicilian, who came knocking, Ferrari. And they had to pay the get a clause from the Williams deal to get back in the, in the Ferrari. And who came back in the two to drive for Williams? Nigel Mansell. You know, so if John had stayed in Williams and got a lot more success and, and F, an F1 race wins, Ferrari would still be there for him. What other offers came knocking then after that? Basically, uh, so much sold to, to EJ, you know. Um, and I think, based on my, my my cow performance, it wasn't too far into the 89 season that Peter War rang Glenn Waters, who our team was based on. He was only about 10 miles from F1 to Tom's. And this Glenn then phoned me and said, look, this guy, Peter War, wants to meet you. Have a, have a meeting with you, right? And that's when we went to the meeting then at the Ketchum Hall, and that's when it happened. And if, you, know, you don't get too many opportunities in life to and to come in to join Lotus uh, at the time. He's had a, had a good good branding and were competitive. Um, 
was a great opportunity. And then, of course, what's I think what sold it to them for me was the four-day test at Silverstone, the Goodyear tyre test, and a private test we did at Snedderton. Because that day, Hazel Chapman, God rest her soul, came down to watch the test. Now, you wouldn't get Hazel there for, for no money. And I thought, something's going on here. They were trying to impress Hazel uh, about my speed or answer. And I think when I did the four-day Goodyear test, each day we put on set tires at the end. And the last day, I got to drive the Tickford 55 car. And the front page of Autosport that week after said, he's done in the new Mansell. I think I was about six or seven crickets overall. You know, and I taught them how to preload the spring. You go stiffer, and we were going quicker. Then we, pre- which I learned from Trevor Foster in three thousand with EJ. So I went there, worked for for the Lotus, and and then PK qualified quite well and finished fourth in the Grand Prix, thanks to this EJ setup. You know, but they don't talk about that. Do they? Was was PK there at the four day test at mm-hmm, Silverstone? Mm-hmm. So you were able to watch, observe, learn, tell him about the springs. <laughs> No, the engineer was telling me because the engineer, my engineer at the time was Mike Cochran and then he was talking to Frank Durney, he was PK's guy and, and so on. So they tried with PK and he was going quicker as well. But that, I think, convinced them to, to, to sign me up. Martin, it's a fantastic story. It didn't have the ending that it deserved. How often do you ponder what might have been? Listen, Tom, if you've been down the road, you know, if, buts and maybe, you know, Damon got great success and he deserved that. He stuck in there and he survived that period of his life. Jean went on to, to become a great ambassador for Ferrari, had a great career in, in, in F1 and earned good money. And I have to say that, you know, for me, the morning of my accident, I had four contracts after 13 Grand Prix, all being paid to drive. I hadn't got to bring any money. So I think that was great um, athletes on my abilities. People realised how good Del Boy was. This young lad was obviously keeping on his, on his toes. So um, who knows where we would have gone to after, after that. But I'm still here talking to you. I have a great family. I raised my son in uh, Lotus Cup UK. And again, I, I look at friend Paul Golding coming back and forth. Most part, I was racing with, with Lotus branding behind that. So thank you very much, Paul, to give me uh, a new lease of life again on that. Uh, I'm, a ba- I'm a, still a driving 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 standard steward for Goodwood uh, for the members meeting and for the revival. So it's a good way of going out and losing friends again. I became my F1 steward for, for three or four years. So life's been good, you know. I haven't got millions behind me, but, you know, people find people that have money behind them aren't necessarily any happier, you know. Thank you very much for your time. It's been great to chat. Tom, it's great, great to talk to you. What might have been had Martin not crashed at Jerez? There's no doubt in my mind that he was quick enough to succeed in Formula One. He had the talent and the determination to win races. But it's not that which sets him apart because many people have won races in Formula One. What makes Martin Donnelly unique is the courage and the positivity he's shown in adversity. What he went through in the aftermath of his crash is gut-wrenchingly awful, yet he remained positive and he's an inspiration to us all. Martin, many thanks for your time and for sharing your remarkable story. And if you want to keep up to speed with what Martin's doing now, why don't you take a look at his website, donnellytrackacademy.com. And please send in your thoughts and stories about Martin. Did you watch him race? Did you ever bump into him at Ed's Cafe near Snetterton? Let me know at Tom Clarkson F1 on Twitter or use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid and I'll read out some of your messages at the end of next week's show, which segues nicely into what you sent in after my catch up with Christian Horner last week. There's always a lot of interest in what Christian has to say and this latest episode was no exception. Let's start with this from Will Williams. As a Mercedes fan, I've always had an admiring hate for Christian. He's so incredible at what he does that you end up hating how good he is. Well, that's one way of looking at it, Will. Thanks for the note, and I'm sure you're not the only Mercedes fan who has a grudging respect for Christian Horner. And what about this from Nav F1? Christian took over a team that was absolutely nowhere and made it one of the most dominant forces and known names in Formula One, alongside Newey and Marco, of course. Love him or hate him, he's a genius. Well, thanks for getting in touch, Nav. 
There's no doubt that Red Bull's record in Formula One speaks for itself. 87 wins and nine world titles and counting. And finally, let's hear from Gelva. Despite all the regulation changes, Christian has had Red Bull in the top three with a potentially race-winning car every year since 2009. That's outstanding leadership. Well, it's certainly an impressive feat. All of these top guys in Formula One have incredible work ethics and are really impressive. Well, we'll leave it there for this week. Thank you to everyone who got in touch. I read all of your messages. And don't forget to give me your thoughts on Martin Donnelly. I can't wait to hear what you have to say about him. And if you need something else to listen to now, how about our episodes with people Martin mentioned? Eddie Jordan, Damon Hill, Tommy Byrne, Derek Warwick and Johnny Herbert. There are links to all of those interviews in the episode description. For now, though, thanks for listening and we'll catch up again next week. F1 Beyond the Grid is produced by Formula One and Audio Boom Studios. Until next time, keep it flat out. <laughs>